uh, in 1 Kings chapter 21. And I'm uh, uh, going to end up putting all this together in a couple of weeks with Ahab and um, Jehoshaphat because they are kings of the northern and southern kingdom semi-simultaneously. Uh, Ahab actually comes to power during the latter reign of Asa. And then Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, takes over in Judah as king during the reign of Ahab. And of course, we've already highlighted several weeks ago the fact that Jehoshaphat was extremely successful, an extremely godly man, and um, had, had really improved the life the army, the finances of the southern kingdom. Meanwhile, Ahab was anything but a godly king and had emphasized that by taking a wife uh, of a different race, okay, which was not supposed to happen for the Jew. And then not only that, but she was the daughter of, of a high priest of a foreign god, and so it was just the tale of two polar opposites going on with, with Jehoshaphat being godly and Ahab being so ungodly. Um, and then with Ahab, we've kind of studied him a little bit and we've seen the fact that I believe this, he was at least somewhat spiritually sensitive. And that also may be one of the reasons why he was, he, why he was so wanting to be close to Jehoshaphat. Have you known people before that, that just kind of have a foot in the world, and, but then there's a, there's a sense that they really want to do right and, and maybe come to church and do the right things? And I sense that a lot with Ahab. And hopefully through our study that, that you can kind of see that for yourself because because I don't try to ever preach opinions, but that is a little bit of an opinion of mine. Okay, so we won't tread very far into that thought, and I'll let you kind of study it out for yourself and what we know about Ahab. But he is certainly uh, one of those guys that seems to spend a lot more time in the ungodly side than the godly side. Yet there is still a spiritual draw that, that we do see him uh, maintain from time to time. Now, I will say this, I don't expect to see Ahab in heaven. I mean, I, I just really don't. I, uh, man, for me, the verdict's out on King Saul. I mean, if you want to, you know, we're, if you're reading in 1 Samuel this month, the things that Saul gets up to and, and things is just kind of like, oh, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm on the fence with that one for sure. And uh, we can debate about that later because we're not talking about King Saul tonight. We're talking about Ahab. And in chapter 21, we have probably one of the most recognized stories, not for the good, that we have about Ahab. And it starts off with this. We all want things that we know we will probably never have, right? The other day when uh, Cade was with us, uh, I was sitting at the desk and, and I was doing a few things and he came over and he had his cars. I'd bought him a couple little Hot Wheels. Seems to be the thing to do every time he comes to our house that he always buys a couple of new Hot Wheels. And one of them was a 60-something Grand Torino. It was really a cool looking little Hot Wheel. And, and uh, I said, well, okay, what do, you, what do you think you'd want your first car to be? You know, he's seven years old. That's no time like the present to start thinking about your first car, right? And he said, well, granddad, he said, I really want a Lamborghini. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, I was really proud that he knew what a Lamborghini was. I mean, that was a proud granddad moment right there. But, uh, but then I was like, well, you know, you might want to lower your standards just a little bit. I said, because I said, I said, Kate, I said, do you realize a Lamborghini costs more than the house we're in right now? He goes, Really? I said, yeah, I said, they are really expensive cars. And I said, how about a Chevy? <laughs> you, know, you know, lower the standards. Just like, you know, I didn't want to burst a bubble real, real fast. But, you know, I mean, uh, we'd all, you know, we can all relate to that, though. We saw some, in South Florida, you see some really cool sports cars and stuff. And, 
Man, the new Corvettes, oh my goodness gracious, I can picture me going 148 miles an hour in one of those things. Whew, son, but we know that'll probably never happen, right? Matt, we're praying still that the Lord will bless us that way, but uh, uh, probably never going to have a car quite like that, for sure. We may want a million dollars, but it's probably not going to be God's will to just hand us a million dollars. And unfortunately, we might have all been in the situation where we have wanted what somebody else had. Ever been there? Sure, we all have. It might be a relationship. You know, we all want Jesse's girl. Y'all remember back uh, the 80s? Come on. Um, don't, I didn't ask you to sing it. I just said uh, you remember it. Uh, it might be a house, it might be a job, it could be a lot of things that we want that somebody else has, and that's when we remember that God told us, thou shalt not covet, one of the Ten Commandments. But we all know what it is like to want things that are out of our reach. However, if you were the king of a land you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. You could pretty much take whatever you wanted. You could pretty much have just whatever your heart desires. And again, I try to do this as often as possible just to kind of keep things relevant, keep things moving on a seven-day-a-week type thing. But if you're reading through 1 Samuel, remember when uh, uh, Israel said, we want a king. And remember... God said, hey, this isn't a slight against you, Samuel. He said, we're going to give them their desire. And so Samuel's like, okay, whatever. And so he went over and he told the people that you may want a king, but this is what he's going to do. Remember, he's going to take your kids. He's going to tax you. He's going to do all of these things. He tried to tell them all the bad things that would happen with a king and Sure enough, that's exactly what Saul did, and that's exactly what kings continued to do on past Israel's first king, including Ahab. And he certainly exhibits here in our verses ahead of us in this message somebody who gets whatever his heart desires. Hopefully, now we would be a considerate king or queen and respect what people have and need and serve well but that is not always the case as we see in this message Ahab the whiny king boy does he ever put on a show here in just a second he's a piece of work I'm telling you we've already seen this he's not a very godly man to say the least and now we see a side of him that makes him even more undesirable Hopefully we can allow the Lord to use this to, explo uh, to expose some of our own faults and or warn us against some of the same pitfalls he experiences here. And I want to read beginning in 1 Kings 21 verse 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel hard or next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. Or, if it seem good to thee, I'm going to give you the worth of it in money. But Naboth said unto Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto you. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down on his bed turned away his face, and would eat no bread. What a whiny boy. Man, I'm telling you what, the first thing I see is the pout. 
And that's where our handout starts tonight. The first thing we see clearly in verses 1 through 4 is Ahab had the pout down. And he had it down pat, didn't he? I mean, you can almost even hear the heavy sigh and see the bottom lip roll out. Man, oh man, what? What an amazing, I mean, whatever version of the Bible you read this story in, you go, huh, it's a grown man. I mean, you can see this so clearly. Naboth, by the way, has good reason to reject the king's request. Again, he says this, the land is inherited land. That means that several hundred years prior, when the children of Israel came into Israel, the promised land, that Naboth's family were given this section of land by the Lord. Okay? Now, let me, let me just tell you this. If you've got family property, okay, some people do. If you've got family property, what you hold on to that usually, don't you? You usually consider that something that's kind of like, I guess, our ace in the hole. You know? It's like, it just, but it's probably more than that. It's probably something that's kind of special to you. Right? And, and so, regardless of the fact that it was inherited land, that's a good reason, but it was also very special to Naboth. And one other thing, too, I would say this. It probably took years to cultivate this vineyard. How do I know that? Because I've done a little bit of study on vineyards in especially the Old Testament. Because Isaiah talks about them an awful lot. And Isaiah uses it as a really good spiritual application between good grapes and bad grapes. Um, And so in that study years ago, I just... I just said, all right, got to know a little bit about a vineyard. And so I went all the way back to the law and when vineyards were established and how you're supposed to establish a vineyard. And first year you plant it, the second year it brings fruit uh, that is all, every bit of it, given to, to, the, uh, to the temple. And then finally you can begin to profit off of a vineyard on the third to fourth year that you have it. But it takes a lot, an awful lot of work to put a vineyard together, to, to, uh, to design it, to, to cultivate it. And you know as well as I do that, you know, grapes come in the late summer. And, and so sometimes the weather's going to just absolutely be disastrous. And so there's just a lot of effort that went in. And so Naboth's family vineyard had probably been around for centuries. And also, I will say this, in the Old Testament, it took a very special piece of land to have a vineyard. Uh, the staff and I, went, we went out to a, a pastor's fellowship in uh, Brownfield back in uh, February. It was right before the big freeze. And, um, uh, and, and uh, while we drove into Brownfield, there's, there's grapevines everywhere out there now. And I don't know if you've noticed, but the, these grapevines and vineyards are popping up all over West Texas. But I will say this, they look nothing like an Old Testament vineyard. First of all, it had to be on a real rocky type of soil that was somewhat tiered or made to be tiered. That way the water would come down and wash the plants, but not keep them in the water. Okay, so then you had to build a tower because thieves were always trying to come in and steal your grapes. And that's why you had a tower. And usually the vineyards were also fenced to keep the varmints out. I mean, listen, having a vineyard was a real pain. It was a real expense. But I will have to say this, that once you get your vineyard established, it's probably going to be worth it in the long run if you have the upfront money to do it. Okay, so that's just... Uh, one of the reasons why, in my mind, Naboth was like, uh-uh, I'm not giving you my vineyard, because it took a long time to cultivate. 
when you combine the fact that it's inherited and it takes a lot of time, then he has a real attachment to this land, and therefore he told King Ahab, no. That's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, he just told the king, no. And the king reacted really well, didn't he? I mean, he, he likes hearing the word no. Let me just pause right here for a second and, and ask you and me, do we, when we really have our heart set on something like the word no? Doesn't matter if it's going through the uh, drive through at Dairy Queen and we really want a blizzard and the ice cream machine's broken. Can I get an amen? You know? Or if it's, hey, I really would like to have this and it just keeps coming back. No, no, no. What do we, how do we react to that? Do we react like Ahab? Go lay ourselves up in our bed, turn against the wall, refuse to eat and suck our thumbs? I added that, by the way. I mean, is that the way we react? You know? Um, I gotta be a I gotta be honest with you. I'm a pretty good powder. I am. I don't like that about me, but I am. When there's the brand new driver that comes out, by the way, golf clubs are expensive these days. Like five to six hundred bucks for one club. Yeah. I'm telling you. Hey, take up on the love offering next time I need one. But uh, no, I did. Did I say that out loud? I, I did, didn't I? I, was saying, I was, but, uh, um, but man, I'm telling you, stu- and, and when I'm going, oh, five, oh, I can, you know, harvest a kidney. There you go. But, uh, um, I, but when I'm like, oh, I start pouting, you know? It's just, yeah, exactly. I'm telling you. So we can all pout when we don't get what we want. Isn't that true? Let's watch ourselves. Ahab gives us a really good example of how not to act when we uh, don't get what we want. Okay? So verses 5 through 7. But Jezebel, okay? Who's Jezebel? Ahab's wife, the queen. Jezebel, his wife, came to Ahab and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad? Why are you pouting that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I drink of the Naboth. Right? I mean, this is the way he's talking. His pitch has just gone three levels higher. I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and I said to him, Give me that vineyard. I'd even pay you for it. Or else, if it please thee, I'm going to give you another vineyard for it. But he answered, I can't give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Are you not the king, sissy boy? Arise and eat bread, let thine heart be merry, I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Wow. Jezebel's like, well, telling you what, we now know who wears the pants in the family. And that's your next point. We've all heard the expression, now we know. Who wears the pants in Ahab and Jezebel's family? It seems that Jezebel does. So after a spell of pouting, she steps in to get things done. She tells him, hey, cheer up. Cheer up. Then she challenges him to step up. And remember that he is the king. And nobody tells the king, no. This then is somewhat of a wake-up call for Ahab, for sure. Because Jezebel wears the pants in the family. 
So, here's the plan. The last part of tonight is the plan. And, unfortunately, it is executed perfectly. Verse 8. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal, just as if he wears the pants in the family. And he sent the letters, or she sent the letters, to the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, sons of the devil, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God with a big G? Jezebel? Are you kidding me? You're using the name of God for something? Yeah, for her own purposes. Did thou not blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him that he may die? That's right. We're going to set up a mock trial and we're going to say this and this and this and we're going to verify this, this, this and this against Naboth and we are going to pronounce him some sort of a instigator and we are going to give him the sentence of death because he thought a lot about his family's inheritance and knew all the hard work that had gone in to make the vineyard what it was for his family's name. Verse 11, the men of the city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants of this city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, sealed and signed in King Ahab's name. They proclaimed a fast, in verse 12, set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and set before him and the men of Belial witnessed against him and even against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king, and they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, you have yourself a new piece of land. Take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive, but is now dead. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. zippity doo da, zippity a. Man. What an evil plan. Can you imagine? Can you imagine conspiring in such a manner, really? If you didn't get what you wanted? I hope you can't. But I fear sometimes our lusts do somewhat overcome us if we're not careful. Jezebel showed just how ruthless she was as a person. We might have already been suspicious of her because of her upbringing and who her dad was and who her people were. They were heathens, not God's people for sure. Might have already been suspicious of her, but now those suspicions are confirmed. Jezebel was a very wicked woman. She was a very wicked woman. She was not at all concerned for others or for what God's law meant or anything like that. She didn't care about Naboth's reasons for keeping his property. You see, she didn't care about God's law at all. 
She didn't care about the history of Naboth's family and how that Naboth's family inherited that land as given to them likely by Joshua when they came into the promised land and conquered it. She didn't care about anything like that. She didn't care about what uh, Leviticus said about owning property and, and how that property was supposed to stay in your family forever. Right? She didn't care about anything like that. So, we need to know to force one's position over another is just not good. To force one's position over another is just not good. To accept this treachery really does show Ahab's true heart to us. Shows just how evil he was as well. As he merrily went on his way, I've got some new property now to raise my herbs. Really? Probably a thousand-year-old vineyard. I mean, at least hundreds of years old. Well taken care of, probably well manicured. Certainly a productive situation. They didn't care. I didn't care at all. That's pretty sad, isn't it? So, ultimately, the whiny king got his way in the end. And I wonder how many times we whine our way into getting what we want. Even, even if it's at the expense of another. And that other person may actually be somebody we love or care about. Yet, because of what we want, that desire harms that relationship. It's a very telling story about the personalities of Ahab and Jezebel for sure, but hopefully it's a lesson we can relate to and we will relate to. Because you and I both know we're going to run into things that we really want. Now, I didn't say need, okay? Because God says, I'm going to take care of your needs. But we'll run into things that we really want. And that's when this story really becomes applicable. Because we all know that we can all be whiny sometimes. You ever been there? You ever witnessed your voice change octaves real quickly and Yeah, we all have. But we need to ask ourselves, does my whining and is my whining leading to the planning and scheming to get what I want no matter what? See, we're confronted with that, this possibility, I believe, through the actions of Ahab and Jezebel. I believe this continued look at the personality of Ahab causes us to really be careful about who we are becoming in our character. More Christ-like or more Ahab-like? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for, again, preserving such a powerful a powerful occurrence in your word that we can we can read together study together and certainly glean from together i pray you'd continue to uh, speak to us through your word because each and every one of us are bound to come up to a situation like this from time to time so take your word and help us to apply it to our hearts and then to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed tonight.